Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. You're listening to Top Traders Unplugged, and thanks so much for tuning in today. I know how valuable your time is, so I appreciate you spending some of it with me here today. Now, on today's show, I'm talking to Peter Campbellin, co-founder and CEO of Systematic Alpha Management. His firm has recently received the 2014 Pinnacle Award for Best Diversified CTA. This comes as their Futures program celebrates its 10th anniversary. But it has not been an easy path for Peter and his team, and in 2011, following a drawdown, they lost 90% of their assets due to investor redemptions. Having come back from this drawdown, Peter feels that today their firm is stronger than ever, and he shares fascinating insights to a CTA strategy that is completely different to the traditional trend-based managers. And for those who are new to the show, I just want to let you know that you can find all of the show notes, including a full transcript of today's episode on the toptradersonplug.com website. Now let's get started with part one of my conversation. I hope you will enjoy it. Peter, thank you so much for being with us today. I uh, I really appreciate it. Sure. Now, what's quite interesting about your firm is that you started back in 2004 when not many CTAs were doing short-term trading. And what's quite funny is that my previous guest, Carsten Schroeder from Amplitude, also founded his firm in 2004. So... Let me start by, one, congratulating you on your 10th anniversary, which I believe was at the end of last month. Right. Um, and perhaps start by asking you, what was so special about that time when clearly some firms, including yourself, were beginning to look outside the classical medium to long term trend following trading style? Yes, well, actually, our track record goes even beyond 2004. We started managing uh, individual managed accounts in 2001. Okay. Uh, um, and in 2004, we decided to consolidate uh, the you know, small individual managed accounts that we had, and we launched the fund. Uh, so before the fund, we do have an audited track record that goes back to 2001. Uh, the roots of our firm come we have to go back to late 90s uh, in 1998 i uh, established a broker dealer in new york city uh it, it was an introducing broker dealer that was trading equities has had nothing to do with futures at all uh and uh, at that time markets were good uh most stocks were going up and we were basically trading stocks for individual investors and then in year 2000, uh, the internet bubble burst and uh, NASDAQ had a major um, collapse. And that was the time when we wanted to come up with a strategy that would perform well in any market environment. We did not want to rely on the direction of the equity markets 
And that was the period when I met my current partner, Alexei Cheklov. That was in the year 2000. Uh, he, by that time, already worked for a long-term trend following CTA, one of the original ones called TrendLogic Associates. Sure. And, and he also worked for a couple of other firms, uh, big hedge fund out of Connecticut and the big French bank. So he had all the experience um, building the models, and I had the initial setup infrastructure and initial clientele. So it took us about a year from 2000 to 2001 to develop the strategies. And uh, we started offering these strategies to our you know, individual investors at that time. And again, the, the foundation of our current program, which is uh, a market neutral program actually, uh, comes from a period when uh, markets were going down and we had to have a strategy that would perform well in any market environment. So uh, some of the ideas that people apply to long short equity trading, to statistical arbitrage trading, to uh, spread trading in, in fixed income markets, for example, we applied to uh, major uh, global equity indices and currency futures. And this is the main part of what we do. And uh, as I said, from 2001 through 2004, we were managing uh, these small individual accounts, uh, polishing our strategy. And in 2004, we launched our fund, uh, which uh, yes, recently celebrated 10 years of, of, of track record. Uh, so that is our background. We go back, you know, to late nineties, early two thousand. Sure. And and as you as you point out, you know, ten years later your firm has recently been awarded uh, by CTA Intelligence with its US performance award for two thousand and fourteen. Uh, which must be a great way to uh, to celebrate this milestone that you've just passed. But let me also ask you, what does it mean for you to win such an award? And and also what does it mean for your business development, do you think? Well, most recently, we actually won another award, which is even more prestigious, I would say, which is a Pinnacle Award uh, as the best diversified CTA for 2013. Uh, this is our fourth major award. Uh, in 2009 and in 2012, we won uh, similar awards from HFM Week. So um, I would say... The current environment for CTAs, for futures traders in general, is quite difficult uh, to raise capital. Uh, over the last three, four, five years, most of the capital that was raised was going to big multi-billion dollar firms. So on the one hand, uh, it's very nice to win all these awards and gives us a great uh, name recognition. On the other hand, we also understand that getting a client requires a lot more than just, you know, a good award. We need to continue doing a good job for the clients from the performance side. We have to explain our story uh, uh, better uh, because uh, what we offer is something very unique, uh, uncorrelated. Um, in fact, our correlation to CTAs in general is, is close to zero which means that what we're doing is very, very different from traditional CTAs. And sometimes explaining it to investors and even some professional investors that are supposed to understand and recognize what we do, sometimes it's a challenge. So awards are nice, but it's not the only thing that we need to, to build the business. <laughs> no, that, that, that is true. Um, and and actually, in a sense, that's exactly why we're having our conversation today, because what I found over the years is that uh, you're right, you know, it is a difficult strategy for people to comprehend. And I think by by documenting it in this way, where people can go back and listen to uh, you telling the story, you explaining the strategy as many times as needed, really is, uh, you know, why hopefully people will get a, a much better grasp of, of what you're doing uh, after listening to, uh, to our podcast. But before we go into the details about the company today, 
Uh, I'd like you to go even further back. I know you just touch upon it a little bit uh, before in the introduction about, uh, you know, roughly when you met your partner and so on and so forth. But I actually like to to go back even further. And, and, and if you would share a little bit about your background from, from even before you started your, your introducing broker, just for people to get a feel for for you uh, as a person and, and your partner as a person and, and then how it evolved. Because at the end of the day, although we are, you know, talking about systematic trading and systems and models, it's all based on on individuals and people in the background. And so I think it's important that we we try to uh, give people as much as we can in, in that respect as well. So if you wouldn't mind, just uh, take us back to to where it all started and how you ended up in in the systematic trading world, which is not, you know, where most people end up nowadays. Well, um, Alex and I, we come from the same city, which is Moscow, Russia. I came to New York on uh, September 11th, uh, 2000, uh, 1989. That was a, such a special date <laughs> to yes. come to New York. Yeah. Uh, Alexei came, I believe, a year later in 1990. And um, when I came, I was uh, you know, a kid. I uh, went to high school in New York. It was a public school. Then I went to more or less a public college. So my whole education probably cost me less than $10,000, which is, <laughs> you know, next to nothing. Exactly, sure. And then uh, after school, I graduated with a, with a degree in finance, uh, magnum cum laude. I was one of the best in the class. The truth of the matter was that it was very hard to find a job. I, that was 1995. And... Um, there were very few financial jobs available. So the very first job that I took was in a broker dealer. I uh, passed Series 7, which is a you know, license someone needs to have to, to work in a broker dealer environment. Sure. And I just wanted to be close to the financial world, even though that job did not pay any money. You know, I was getting $250 per week for working there. And uh, after doing it for about four months, um, and passing Series 7, I decided to, to leave the broker-dealer, and uh, I was looking for other opportunities, and, uh, you know, it was very tough to get a job, and later I ended up in a firm that was a small boutique firm that uh, did a lot of private placements. It, it worked with small-cap stocks, raising capital, uh, and... Uh, it was a small firm, as I said, maybe 10 people all together, and I introduced to the owner some of the high net worth uh, Russians that I knew at that time. And um, it was funny, after uh, my former boss uh, made some nice money off my introductions, and he uh, chose not to pay me a bonus as a result of that, that's when I realized that maybe I should go and start my own firm if I had these, you know, connections to the, you know, uh, high network individuals. Uh, and uh, if I can't make money even in a small boutique firm, why don't I do it on my own? Sure. So that's, that's how I started the broker dealer. At that time, I was 21 years old. I was one of the youngest, if not the youngest owner of the District 10 Manhattan broker dealer, uh, uh, New York. Sure. Uh, and, uh, as I explained before, through, you know, from 1998 through 2000, things were going, going well. We were making good money for our clients. They gave us discretion over their accounts. And then, uh, market started to collapse and we needed to have an absolute return oriented strategy. So these were equity investments predominantly at the time. Initially, yeah, we were just trading stocks, nothing sure. to do with equities at all. Sure. Alexi's background is very different. Uh, he uh, he is the quant at, at our firm. He has PhD from Princeton University. Uh, he worked in academia for a couple of years. He wrote a number of articles, scientific articles, finance-related articles that are very well cited in the in the media. And uh, he had a different trajectory. He he worked at big firms. He had a lot of experience. So I would say if you look at us today, we have, on one hand, somewhat similar background. On the other hand, our personalities are very different. He is the quant, 
I am the common sense guy. You know, I'm the business guy. He is the, the you know, the the, the brains and you know, like the blood of the of the of the of the, of the company. Uh, so I think our tandem together is very good. I remember one investor told me once that if both of us were professors, he would never allocate to us. <laughs> so sometimes it, it makes sense to have a common sense guy next to a PhD guy. Sure. I think we have that combination. Uh, we've been through a lot over the last 14 years. We've been together, good and bad times. And uh, we know each other well. We know each other's weaknesses and strengths. And we're trying to make sure that everyone is doing you know, his job. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, we have, you know, we have to have a common decision on any thing, things that we do. Uh, so we, both of us have to basically approve or disapprove certain, uh, decisions. Uh, some research related decisions are driven by Alexi and some business related decisions are introduced by me. So sure. this, this is how. This is how we work, and that, that's where we come from. Now, you mentioned that Alexi was with Trend Logic, and, and I remember the name, but I, I have to admit I don't remem remember sort of the specifics. But the name suggests that it was some kind of trend based uh, strategy. Right. But they when go back to the 70s, they were one of the original trend following CTAs. And Alexi started working with them, I believe, in 96, 97. And they hired him to, at, even at that time, to diversify and build some of the strategies that are not necessarily from following strategies. Okay, because that was my question exactly. Then, then, then the transition from being with a trend-based firm for you then to go and look at short-term trading. So that explains the uh, the direction you took even even well, at that yeah, time. It, it was a combination of things. So Alexi worked with them uh, on the uh, some uh, some mean reverting strategies, number one. At the Bank Paribas that he also worked, he was doing fixed income spread trading, which somewhat resembles what we do, but uh, we do it via the equity index and currency futures mm -hmm. instead of trading fixed income markets. Uh, but the idea is similar. We would go long and short, highly, highly related markets, expecting a reversal to some kind of a mean of the spread. So these ideas came from, you know, Alexis' experience at, 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 at the French bank. And of course, as I mentioned before, we wanted to have a strategy that will have no dependence on the direction of the equity markets. Sure. Our data to S&P, to other hedge funds, and to CTAs was interesting. Sure. It's close to zero. Yeah. Now, obviously, we'll go into much more details, but um, I just wanted to ask just again one of these sort of uh, introductory questions uh, before we launch into that. and. And, you know, obviously running uh, systematic alpha management today is, is a big part of your life. But when you're not working, what, what, what do you like doing, Peter? Well, uh, I live in two cities. I live in New York, and that's where I work. And sure. I also live in Miami. That's where my family lives. Okay. Uh, so uh, every weekend I go to Miami, more or less, unless I travel for sure. business. And uh, I think it helps a lot in, in my business endeavors as well. Because when you are away from the city, when you are away from the office, and when you, let's say, walk on the beach, uh, sometimes some of the greatest ideas could come unexpectedly. You, know? sure. you, you, might, you might play with your kids and all of a sudden you, you, you're realizing, why don't I do this or that? And yeah. uh, so this has been my lifestyle for the last eight, nine years. Um, I... I work in New York and I live in Miami. Right? Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Uh, that's excellent. And uh, of course, I love sports. I love to ski. I love to play golf. I love to play tennis. Uh, I like to go out with my friends. Sure. Uh, in Miami, there are some very interesting people nowadays living. Yeah. Uh, most of my friends are Russian for mm -hmm. reasons. Um, it's just easier for me to... To communicate, I guess, with them or to to understand each other. Sure. And uh, there's some, you know, very wealthy Russians in Miami nowadays. But 
again, for whatever reason, I never talk business with them. I, I don't try to uh, recruit them or get their money under management. Uh, sure. I prefer to stay just friends. Um, yeah. I, di- I did have one experience with one of my friends. He allocated a million dollars and six months later, his return was flat and he was complaining big time. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why don't I make money for him? And I told him, look, you know, just, just take your money back and let's just continue being friends. <laughs> yeah. No, that that's probably a, that's probably a good idea. Now, launching in a little bit to the business uh, side of things, um, maybe you could start by just giving a brief overview of the programs you run today, when they started, and how the uh, assets on the management in each program, uh, where they stand today. Yes. So, at the moment, we're running two programs. Um, our original Systematic Alpha Futures program was started as I mentioned before, in late in 2001, and the fund started in 2004, and that is the program that won four awards, uh, two from HFM Week, one from CTA Intelligence, and one most recently from the Pinnacle Awards. Uh, that program, the evolution of AUM um, was like that. Uh, in 2001, more or less, we started with very little assets, maybe three, four, five million under management. When we started the fund in 2004, we ended the year, uh, again, I think at around 5 million. So our assets from 2001 to 2004 ranged from 5 to 10 million dollars. Sure. And then in 2005, we already had over 20 million in the fund. Uh, 2006, the number grew to 80 million. And then we were more or less doubling our assets under management and we peaked in February of 2011 at over $700 million in the program. And in 2011, uh, we were one of the largest truly alternative CTAs. Not the largest, but, you know, uh, QIM was there with a lot of assets at that time. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, three, four more firms, but I would say we were top 10 in terms of AUM. And uh, 2011 was a tough year for us. It was the only negative year on, on track record. And in fact, we had uh, six consecutive negative months uh, starting in March of 2011 through August of 2011. And uh, most of the capital that we had was in direct managed accounts. Uh, well over 500 million actually was in direct managed accounts that had daily liquidity. And... Uh, uh, most of the clients redeem. Uh, so our assets from 721 million at the highest point went down to as low as 50 million, uh, a year later. Uh, the low of AUM was in, uh, March or April of 2012. Uh, since that time, we've been growing assets, but not at the rate that I would have expected given our performance of the last two years. Sure. Uh, in 2012 and 2013, you know, we generated very solid returns and uh, we were ranked among the, you know, you know very high. Sure. Uh, all CTAs. So some of the capital is coming back. Uh, some of the former clients uh, came back, which is a good sign, but very slowly and... Uh, <laughs> Hesitantly, I would say. Sure. So at the moment, we are running a total of 100 million under management, uh, and we hope to grow it in the coming uh, months. Sure. Uh, with our new project, maybe we could talk about it later, but we yeah. are opening a usage fund soon okay. for in investors. Yeah, absolutely. In 2011, we introduced the second program that we have, which is called Systematic Alpha Multi Strategy uh, Fund or program. Uh, that program came about after the experiences that we had in 2011. We wanted to come up with a program that will have more diversification. And, uh, this program has a 50, 50, uh, pers- you know, uh, split allocation to our 50% is allocated to our original spread trading program. And the other 50% is allocated to directional. You can call it short term trend following or momentum model. Uh, these models are a lot more similar 
in 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 uh, even style to what other cities, most other cities are, are trading. Directional positions, uh, expecting a continuation of a, of a price move, let's say up and down. So the modern strategy program was introduced in 2011, and at the moment we have about 30, 35 million in it um, under management. Most of the capital uh, in that program that we have is via Deutsche Bank relationship. We are on DB Select platform, both. Our programs are available there, and we have a number of um, different clients invested via Deutsche Bank. Great stuff, great stuff. Now, before we jump to sort of the first real um, topic, I I just wanted to ask uh, one thing. So I think for the purpose of this uh, conversation, we're going to be focusing on the original futures program. Um, but in terms of overall objective for that program, um you know are you are you focusing on a particular environment you mentioned that you 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 the experience came about from the equity markets going down but the the futures program is that designed to make money in all conditions or are there certain environments that you uh you know in particular are looking to make money in in that program well of course uh, certain environments are better than others for example in 2008, the environment for the program was perfect. Uh, that was the time when equity markets were collapsing on one hand. On the other hand, correlation between the equity markets was, was very strong. Uh, everything was going down together, and our market neutral long short spreads, they performed extremely well during that market environment. Uh, the reason for the difficulty in 2011 for us was related to the fact that uh, European equity indices were going down a lot faster uh, with a lot greater volatility uh, compared to the U.S. markets because of the European debt crisis. And this type of an environment was a very challenging environment for us. So. I would say, and at the same time, let's say in 2013, we made money when markets were going up. So from the standpoint of markets going up or down, I would say our correlation of beta is close to zero. What we are not immune to is the volatilities or volatility in the marketplace, but more importantly, relative volatility of major indices to each other. So let's say volatility in the European markets, uh, versus volatility in the U.S. markets. Because when we construct our long short uh, trades, uh, spreads, we would often trade U.S. indices against European indices. And uh, in 2011, uh, volatility in the Europe was a lot higher compared to U.S. and that hurt us. So uh, on average, we are looking, we are, we are benefiting when volatility is elevated, when volatility is high. But we are not outright long vol. You know, we are uh, long and short vol at the same time, but in different markets. So uh, we would prefer bear markets because that's the time when volatility is higher. Uh, but overall, correlation to volatility is positive, but it's not very high. Now... Normally, I would go in and ask certain questions, but I think you bring up a topic that I just want to to uh, dive into a little bit more, if if that's okay. And and that's the thing about you know uh, you're looking to or, or you prefer, uh, in a sense, conditions where the the volatility, uh, if I understand it correctly, of say the U.S. equity markets and European equity markets is somewhat similar, um, and you know they're not diverging too much now. Right. It could be high or low, but yes. somewhat similar. Yes. And of course, in a sense, we, we, we've lived in a world where central banks and, 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 and you know, the introduction of, of monetary unions and so on and so forth, in, in, in my view at least, have meant that to a large extent, economic cycles have become more um, coordinated, if I can use that world, word, especially in the Western world. Um, but we also see a lot of pressure building up, uh, you know, inside these economies. You know, we've used different methods of 
of solving the crisis and not all of them have been the same and not all of them have been have been working uh you know equally well um and we we certainly see now again that you know Europe has certain issues that maybe the US uh, hasn't now in a world of you know in a situation where the world starts to become more um what's the word uh, fragmented and maybe not so coordinated uh, what does that do to a, a, a you know relative value or spread strategy that 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 you're running what 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 are the things that you might be alerted to where you would say hmm something is going on here which is slightly different to what we would like to see well yeah on one hand we are hoping that the volatility in the marketplace will increase. What we've seen in the last two, three months is uh, unprecedented. Um, if you look at the not uh, implied volatility, let's say big VIX index, which is implied volatility of S&P, but realized volatility uh, of S&P 500 has been running at the rate of 6-7% annualized yeah. compared to the n- normal average long term of about 18%. Uh, you can argue 16 percent, 15 percent, but still, it's at least three times lower than it's supposed to be. You know, yeah. where it's yeah. typically trade. So this uh, coordinated assistance of governments around the globe is clearly uh, has clearly helped to reduce the vol to such an extreme levels that it's very difficult for systematic strategies to produce returns. So uh, on one hand, we are looking for some kind of a crisis. We're hoping that it's going to be some kind of a correction because, uh, you know, the best investment one could make over the last five years would be long S&P 500. Sure. Uh, and we know from the history that these periods do not last. We also know from the history that the previous time volatility hit such a low points were the times when soon after some some crisis would develop. Uh, the last time we saw volatility at this level uh, uh, implied, not even realized, sure. not implied, was back in uh, late 2006, early 2007. Uh, and we know what happened uh, <laughs> a year later. Yeah. So uh, to answer your question, on one hand, we are sensitive to differences in volatilities around the globe. Um, on the other hand, we do want volatility to, to go higher. Sure. And uh, our models are very adjusted. Uh, so if, if the environment changes, we would adjust quickly to the, uh, to the new regime. Sure. Uh, for example, uh, the look back window to calculate our hedge ratio. So let's say how many contracts to go long and short. Let's say S&P against FTSE, you know, British pound contract. Sure. That would be an example that we would trade. Uh, sometimes we would use a 30-day look-back window only, uh, which is a sh- fairly short uh, yeah. window, which means that if, if, uh, if market conditions are changing uh, rapidly, it would be reflected in our hedge ratios quite quickly. Uh, so... Uh, the reason for the very tough period in 2011 was that it was a very unprecedented type of scenario where credit risk of, of certain countries was, was under a question. Uh, and uh, the I remember some months when, let's say, European indices were down 12% a month while S&P was flat. Yeah. Uh, so the divergences on a monthly level were just unprecedented. When an environment is like that, even you know, uh, even our dynamic models can hand, can handle that. Uh, sure. Most of the other times, we are doing a good job, and that's why in ten years we only had one down year, which was 2011. Sure. Uh, all other years were either you know had one one flat year or positive. And I was just going to say, and I guess that's probably maybe part of the reason why you decided to to launch the multi strategy program that builds in certain levels of trend following which i guess will benefit from divergence uh. the idea for the multi strategy program was to 
mix in one portfolio two streams of returns that are not only uncorrelated, but in times of stress for the spread component, it has negative correlation to each other. Yeah. So our directional models tend to produce their best returns when spreads are suffering sure. and vice versa. Sure. That was the the idea. Stand alone, I would say, the directional component that we have in the multi strategy program, the quality of it is not as good standalone compared to the spreads. Sure. But in the combination with the spreads, the product makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Uh, the idea was to reduce the likelihood of large drawdown. At, at an expense of having maybe a larger correlation to CTAs, having some beta maybe to some markets, uh, and uh, at the expense of not having as stable returns as we're used to having in the spreads alone. Of course, absolutely. I mean, in, you know, within trend following, it's inherently unpredictable in terms of the the return stream, and and uh, sometimes that's... one or two months per year would produce your total, you know, PNL for the year. <laughs> exactly. Well, in spreads, we had runs where we would have ten consecutive positive months. For Sure. Small gains every month. Uh, sure. so they're a different return profile. Absolutely, absolutely, great stuff, Peter. Now let me go back to to sort of my 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 normal questioning here, and I wanted to start off to talk a little bit about your organization. Um, I wanted to find out a little bit how you set it up. Uh, obviously, you mentioned that you've had a big change in AUM, and maybe that's also impact how you do things today. Um, but talk me through a little bit how it's structured and also how you've come about using technology uh, to your advantage. I mean, not everyone uh, keeps every single function of the company in-house. Certain people choose to outsource some things. But of course, being a short term, you know, uh, very, with very quick uh turnover let's put it that way in the portfolio clearly you have certain requirements that the longer term or medium term guys even uh, wouldn't have so so right. talk to us a little bit about that well even at the current uh, level of AUM we maintain all the main functions of the firm in-house uh, so uh, and we have I would say five main functions the main one of course is research uh, researching the models and, and the programming, the, the, the trading and the programming back office functions, etc. Uh, the trading that we have is fully automated. Um, uh, we have our own back office uh, because we service managed accounts and uh, a lot of functions on the back, back office side were also automated by us in, in house. Uh, our research uh, uses uh, proprietary software that we built to backtest the models, uh, not on the daily frequency, but we're using one minute resolution of data going back many, many years to, to estimate the parameters that we trade. Sure. And that, that back off, uh, that, uh, re I'm sorry, um, backtesting uh, tool we've been developing for the last, you know, seven, eight, nine years. It's been upgraded. Constantly, we have capability of running uh, various analysis, uh, you know, out of sample, in sample tests, etc., to make sure how, you know that our models are robust. Um, we have compliance, obviously, in house. Uh, uh, marketing is very important, of course. Uh, we do work with uh, a few third-party marketers, but main work. Uh, still done in house uh, on the marketing side, and and trading. Uh, we are open for trading around the clock, twenty four hours, because we trade, you know, uh, Europe, uh, Asia, and U.S. markets. Um, we don't have traders that decide what to buy and sell. Uh, these traders they are monitoring what what the, the machines are executing in an automated way, sure. but. Are there to to make sure that everything is run according to the system, that we have connectivity and, and all that. So, at the moment, all all these tasks are performed by twelve people. Um, most people that we have have stayed with us for well over five years, in some cases ten years. Uh, we were larger uh, when we had more assets under management, 
But at that time, I would say we did not have the amount of automation that we have today. Sure. So if we were to go back to the same AOM levels, uh, I would say the only area where we would be looking to hire more would be research. But every other function is covered quite well. So we don't need to go back to previous headcount. Sure. I think we had 26, 27 people, I believe. Um, and uh, I think from the quality of the service that we're producing today with a smaller group of guys and girls, uh, we are a better firm uh, compared to when we, you know, compared to 2011 when we had a lot more assets. Sure, that. sure. Now, the next area I wanted to uh, talk to you about is is track record because um, certainly if you look at the the longer term um, CTAs, uh, we know that the environment has been very different uh, looking at their track records, you know, before 2009 and after 2009, you can almost draw a line and yeah. see quite difficult conditions and, and different returns. Uh, now, I don't know so much about the, the short term uh, space. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about your observations about uh, the, the market environment and how how should people interpret your track record, meaning, um, you know, have there been some major upgrades of your research and, and therefore the strategy over time so that if you look at the period, say, from 2012 and onwards, perhaps, you know, the system is actually significantly stronger than it was, you know, before 2011. So just give us a little bit of a of insight to how, how, should, how should investors or potential investors Look, look at your track record, in your opinion. Yes, we, we did make some important modifications to the system in 2011 following the experience that we had. And um, I would say that our returns in 2012, which were very strong, uh, primarily were due to the adjustments that we implemented. Uh, again, we are running the same core idea is just the details uh, how we hedge, uh, which markets we trade, or when precisely we'll buy and sell. These these uh, I, details were slightly modified. Um, returns of 2013 were also very good, uh, but I would say had we not cha- made any changes in 11, returns of 2013 would be quite similar. Okay. So we're particularly proud of our returns in 2012. Because if you recollect, 2012 environment was somewhat similar to 2011, actually. The European debt crisis continued uh, in 2012, at least, at least in the first half of 2012. And uh, despite that, we, you know, we generated you know, good returns already with, with the adjustments that we implement. Uh, but if we look at the industry overall, I would say that investors have a lot easier job analyzing and understanding returns of the long-term CTAs uh, because the correlation between them is often 60-70% and they can see which ones are good and which ones are not so good. When you analyze returns of the short-term CTAs, it's a lot more difficult because correlations drop significantly and uh, there are some you know good short-term guys and, and some not so good short-term guys. And uh, it's more difficult to understand the source of the returns. Uh, it's more difficult to understand during which market environments this particular short-term program could do well or not do well. Uh, but I think if investors were to spend some time and uh, uh, understand and analyze uh, short-term players, and find the ones that are really good, it would enhance their returns quite, quite, quite a bit. Uh, so it's, it's, I would say it's more difficult to find a good short term trader, but if you found one, you, you should stick with them, even if they are having a, a local difficult time. Uh, and every manager, I would say, with 10 years of track record at some point will have a drawdown. No, it's impossible otherwise. Absolutely, um, that 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 is a certainty. Um, 
but given the fact, if we stay on this subject a little bit, given the fact that it sounds like you have done well during a period where most uh, managers, and I actually would include short-term guys as well, because I don't think it's been that easy for the short-term traders either, and, and you seem to have done uh, well. So would you say that, is that driven by the fact that you are relative value in if I you can use that word or, or, or spread traders rather than outright looking for directional bets uh, in in the markets you you know take aside the time frame but the fact that you do something differently to a trend follower uh, you know uh, whether it be short term or medium term or long term is that the key reason why the environment has not really been that difficult for you well even when you make money, you always think that the environment is <laughs> <laughs> true. But uh, yes, what we do, we we do very. What we're doing, it's very different from you know ninety nine point nine percent of CTAs. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, we, we speak with a lot of allocators, uh, which ultimately interview a lot of managers, and so the feedback that we get from the investors, from the allocators, is that our programs are very unique. They do not know any other managers that are doing what we're doing, with the exception of maybe one, two names. But even it, even in, in those cases, the, the, those other managers will have their own details, their own risk allocation, their own uh, ways of doing things. So, uh, for example, there's one firm that we know is doing somewhat similar to what we're doing, but if you look at the correlation between our returns and theirs, it's going to be close to zero as well, sure. which, which is remarkable. Yeah. So, the, one of the advantages that we have, I believe, is that we do not have a lot of competition in in what we do because very, as I said, very few, if any, firms are looking at such short term price changes, and not over, not only that, in a market neutral relative value type of trade. Um, so, uh, being a minority helps. And if you're doing a good job, uh, you could stand out. And this is our goal, um, to stand out. And of course, not every year we will be the best manager out there. Uh, there will be times when, you know, long-term CTAs will have very nice performance and, uh, uh, markets will go up almost every day and we would underperform. No question about it, but there will be other periods when we will be, you know, doing a lot better than everyone else. Sure. And that is why it's very, uh, I think, important to have us in a portfolio because we will most likely have negative returns when other managers could be doing fine. And on the other hand, we could generate, you know, our best returns when all other managers are doing poorly. So on the portfolio level, we add a lot of value. Sure. We're not, we're not only providing, you know, absolute returns at the end of the year. Uh, that is very nice to have. But on the, you know, uh, re reduction of the portfolio risk level, we are adding a lot of value as well. And sure. I, I hope investors will recognize that uh, over the long term. Sure. Now, Peter, before we jump to the next area, I, I, I wanted to jump forward a little bit um, because this might be sort of a, a little bit of a research question. But I, I, I know from doing my research a little bit on, on, on your strategy that you often mention that um, you don't change the core of the model, but you do a lot of optimization on a regular basis uh, on, on the parameters. Yes. But when I've spoken to other short-term managers, um before and um, they often tell me that actually model decay is a, is a big issue and that a lot of their models tend to work for two years and then they have to come up with some new models mm. um is that something that you're kind of well neutral is is maybe not the right word but i mean uh, the fact that you do uh, sort of market neutral strategies and so on and so forth do you think that's what's helping you not necessarily having to come up with new models uh, on a regular basis uh, and, and, and your models being quite robust in terms of longevity or? Yeah, well, the core essence of the strategy is 
on one hand very simple and on the other hand is very persistent. Uh, if we just step back and try to understand what we're doing. Uh, that would we, be great, actually. <laughs> we're looking at most liquid and highly related or correlated uh, global equity markets. Uh, again, let's look at the example. Sure. Uh, C100 and S&P 500. Correlation between the two indices on the daily level uh, historically uh, ranges from you know 70-75% up to 90-95%. Uh, and it's very stable over time. Uh, and what helps drive our returns is a very simple fact that these equity indices, they open for trading at different time zones. And hence, their liquidity intraday is not the same at any given hour. It's shifted in time. When Europe opens, S&P futures trade, but they're not as liquid as they will become later on. When U.S. closes, Four o'clock, you know, New York time, European futures trade, but they're not as liquid as S&P at that time. So what, what happens is that while on the daily level, uh, on average, if you average across many, many days go, going back, uh, correlation stays high intraday, intraday, these markets could temporarily diverge from one another for liquidity reasons. These are not fundamental divergences. These are liquidity-driven mispricings. And that's why when vol is high, this is good environment for us because the divergences tend to be larger and, and more often. When vo volatility is low, uh, people are not afraid, they're not scared, and they do not make these little mistakes. So they, they, they have time to react to whatever news is coming out. When, when volatility is very high, and news is coming out, sometimes people don't have, you know, enough time to make the rational decision, and they, they tend to overbuy or oversell uh, certain markets. And, and most people are concerned about a direction of a particular market. They are not concerned how FTSE is traded in relation to s and Most people don't even care about that. And on the other hand, that's all we do. So if you think about it, these time zone differences will always be there. As, you know, the remainder of time. <laughs> let's we, hope. Let's hope so. <laughs> well, we 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 wake up, you know, you know, like let's say UK and uh, US, you know, five to six hours, you know, apart. Yeah. If we talk about Asia, the time difference is more than that, twelve to fourteen hours. So that type that type of structuring w will stay forever. Sure. Uh, markets nowadays, on the other hand, you know experience a lot of correlation because markets you know, uh, and economies are becoming more and more global every day. So what we do when we re-back test and re-optimize parameters, we see in the short-term trading space, it's very important when you buy and when you sell. Because if you're a long-term guy and you hold a position for a month or, or five months, if you buy tomorrow or yesterday, you know, your PNL at the end of the trade will be more or less the same. Sure. Uh, if, you, if you're holding positions for hours, six hours, you know, five hours, 12 hours, day and a half, the timing of your entry and exit plays a crucial role because you, your PNL could be totally different if you are one hour late or one hour early. So uh, while in our case, the main concept stays the same, for all these almost 14 years now, uh, we have to adjust to the ever-changing market environment. We have to uh, try to infer, you know, better when to play these trades, uh, or how to hedge, how many contracts to go long and short, um, which markets to cover. Let's say after 2011, we stopped trading certain European markets. We added some new markets this year, which we think are underlooked by most players, but at the same time have enough liquidity in them. So, so these details, how we execute the strategy, they are adjusted, but the core concept stays the same and this phenomenon doesn't disappear after two years, you know, thankfully. And, uh, we have ways how to monitor that. We have certain mean reversion statistical tests that we do before we optimize our model 
before we find these hedge ratios. We try to look at just simple data without any trading signals at all. We try to simply understand if this uh, time series, let's say the spread, uh, has mean reversion in it or it doesn't. And uh, we're doing these tests uh, constantly. And uh, like, for example, in 2012 and 2013, these tests looked as strong as ever. And that's why returns were quite strong for us. Um, so you know, there, there are different ways how we are monitoring the situation. But my main point is that the, the main source of, 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 of the arbitrage that we're trying to exploit uh, stays, it was there, and it will be there unless, you know, billions and billions of dollars will come in into this market segment and start to arbitrage that away. It's always possible, but we're not seeing it so far. Sure. So, um, obviously, I'd like to go into a, a little bit more details, but just to make sure I kind of understand what you're saying is that um essentially if one of your strategies is to you know um buy or sell a certain um spread between the FTSE and 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 the s p that normally would take place as an example more or less at the same time in the morning where liquidity is somewhat different between the FTSE and and the s p yeah we execute our longs and shorts at exactly the same time exactly um, so that's is yeah. it, that's that's the key yeah and and what we see, let's say, in the early morning hours, Europe is the leader. S and P futures could be the lagger. Yeah, uh, I'm not. I'm talking about two, three a.m. New York time. That's sure. That's the early morning hours. Sure. At around three, four p.m. New York time, it's the opposite. Yeah. Futures on FTSE and CAC and DAX and SMI are traded, but cash markets are closed, uh, and uh, that's the time when S and P is leading the way and. Uh, European indices are following you know, the, the example. And sometimes if they you know, underreact to the moves in S&P, that will produce you know, a move in the spread in a certain direction. And what's interesting is that the next day when European markets reopen, cash markets reopen, uh, they often would price in whatever was underpriced the, the day before. And if it doesn't happen, S&P futures could react and and adjust to the European level. So that produces often moves in the spread in certain direction and then reversal of the spread that we would trade. Uh, and that, that's exactly what we're looking for. Right. Okay. And 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 um, from memory, I seem to recall that your average holding period is about a day or so. Right. So... So it's not so much the difference between the liquidity from the morning where you say the FTSE is the leader and to the afternoon where the S&P might be the leader uh, that you're looking for, or, or did I misunderstand that? Uh, misunderstand that? The average holding time in a trade is about one day or eight to 10 trading hours. That's the other way to describe it. Uh, if, if we see a reversal within an hour, we would take it, of course. Okay. If we have a position that is not reversing, we could be stuck in a position for two, three days, potentially. Okay. And then there are two ways how we can exit a losing trade. We have a hard stop if, if uh, markets are totally diverging from one another. Right. And we r very rarely hit the, the hard stops. Less than 1% of trades are stopped out. The other way we can get out of a losing trade is in a small reversal. Uh, you know, eventually spread would reverse, but not to the level where we took the trade originally. Uh, but uh, if we have a, if we hold a position for longer than one day, we want to get out of that trade as soon as possible. So on the small reversals, we would often, uh, again, in a fully automated way, system systematized way, we would get out of a trade uh, with a loss, having, you know, looking for another opportunity in the future. Sure. See, because after one day, our predictive power is getting weak. You know, we can predict the direction of the spread with very good accuracy within one day. You know, in fact, our hit ratio, percent profitable of trades, is on average about 65% profitable. So roughly two thirds of the trades are positive. Only sure. one third is negative. And that hit ratio is strong only because we have very high predictability within one day. 
beyond one day, markets are very efficient. If markets are diverging for two, three, four days, that means that they're diverging for fundamental reasons, not you know, liquidity reasons. Right. And if that is the case, there's no reason for us to hold a position uh, for another day. Uh, we're trying to basically, as I said, you know, cut the losses if we have the losses and, and wait for another opportunity in the future. Sure. Now, so just let's let's try and put some some numbers on so it makes it easier for everyone to understand. Let's just say that the S and P was trading at at a price of of um, nineteen hundred, yeah. and the FTSE was trading at a price of five thousand nine hundred. So a difference in price of four thousand points, if you take it that way. So is it correctly understood that what you might be looking for is that if that price spread goes to say four thousand and fifty? And you think that within the next, you know, one days of trading, the the spread really should go back to four thousand. Is is that the kind of uh, difference you're looking for? Uh, well, our spreads are not, you know, just pair spreads. We actually have a third leg to a spread, okay. which is a British pound contract. In this particular case, okay, we have to take into account the fact that FTSE futures are denominated in British pounds, while okay. US dollars. Uh, so we have a currency leg that hedges the currency exposure that we have. So it's a triangular relationship. Right. And uh, yeah, let's assume uh, currency is not moving and let's assume S&P is up 1% and FTSE is flat. Yeah. At some point, it will trigger a trade where we would go short S&P and long FTSE, hmm. expecting FTSE to catch up or S&P to come down or, or both to take place. Sure. It, that reversal could happen via the currency move, actually. It's possible that the currency leg will, will move, you know, in reaction to the move in S&P, uh, that will push our PML you know, into the positive territory. So, uh, all three legs are very important. Uh, sometimes, I'll give you another example. Uh, let's assume FTSE and S&P are flat, but currencies, British pound is moving, let's say, 1%. Uh, yeah. That will potentially trigger a trade uh, which will reverse ultimately uh, not because the British pound contract reverses but because equity markets FTSE and S&P will start repricing themselves in relation to one another depending how the currency moves. Mm -hmm. uh, so th th there's some intricate uh, relationships between uh, you know both equity markets and, and the currency and all of them we are taking into account and uh, we could potentially trade. Sure. And, and you know, this 3D, um, you know, uh, way of looking at it, is that required or could you also do uh, spreads between, say, markets both denominated in US dollars? We have spreads like that. An example would be trading uh, Russell 2000 against S&P against NASDAQ 100. Okay. Uh, here we're exploiting a different time of type of arbitrage, which is not, you know, time separated, liquidity separated, but small cap versus large cap stocks, short term divergences. It's a, it's a known fact that small cap stocks sometimes react with some delay to the to the news, uh, to the moves in the large cap stocks, and that could cause temporarily temporarily divergence between Russell and S&P, which later on will be uh, correct. So yeah, we, we have different types of spreads. Uh, there's a third one where we would trade two equity markets, one against another, and a commodity market on top. Interesting. And, uh, yeah. That commodity hedge is used only for those indices that are highly correlated to commodities. Uh, for example, Canadian stock market mm -hmm. or Australian stock market. Mm -hmm. Those indices... You have high correlation to gold, copper, crude oil, let's say, and uh, we would use commodity for that particular uh, relationship. Uh, Fascinating. Tell me, Peter, how many markets do you trade altogether and how many combinations of spreads do you have in your portfolio? Yes, well, uh, we trade approximately 20 to 25 different markets that include... Anybody. 
Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.